from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all and welcome once again to another episode of The Sculptor's Funeral. I am your host, Jason Arkels, a sculptor and educator living and working in Florence City, where all the great sculptors are dead. And I don't feel so well myself. And last week, we discussed Michelangelo and his ill-fated commission for the tomb of Pope Julius II, a magnificent mausoleum, to go into the new basilica at St. Peter's in Rome. Now, this tomb was plagued with delays and problems, everything from the death of the pope to the demands of a new pope, to tight-fisted descendants and the moody temperament of the genius behind it all. The tomb of Julius, as it was finished, in 1545, is a mere shadow of its original grandeur, a comparative mediocrity, containing a single sculpture entirely by the hand of Michelangelo, about three dozen figures short of the original design. But the forty years in which it took to see the tomb to its completion wasn't entirely a waste of Michelangelo's time. Many of the delays in the construction of the tomb were caused by other commissions. During this period, Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling, for instance, and then later the wall behind the main altar of the same chapel, a fresco depicting the Last Judgment. But the most significant, largest, and most time-consuming project that took Michelangelo away from Rome and the papal tomb would be the building projects associated with the Church of San Lorenzo in Florence, which is the subject of today's podcast. In 1513, Pope Julius II died just as Michelangelo was getting underway with sculpting a few figures for the Pope's tomb. The Pope who succeeded Julius was none other than a boyhood acquaintance of Michelangelo's, the son of Lorenzo the Magnificent, Giovanni de' Medici, who took the name Pope Leo X. This, of course, could only be good news for a person in Michelangelo's position. I mean, it's all who you know, right? In fact, Leo X's pontificate would be good for many artists as the life and temperament of Leo X was almost entirely a product of his educated and ambitious father. Giovanni de' Medici was born to be Pope. Through his lofty connections and power, his father, Lorenzo the Magnificent, had arranged for his second oldest son to receive the title of Cardinal Deacon at the age of 13, and he was made a full cardinal by the age of 16. Giovanni studied theology and canon law in Pisa, as well as learning from the greatest humanist minds of the day at his father's court in Florence, the same scholars that had educated Michelangelo. Over the next twenty years, Giovanni de' Medici, he read widely, he traveled widely, and he cemented allegiances with the papal curia just as his own father might. Interestingly, he did not enter the priesthood, even though he was a cardinal. His duties were political rather than clerical. And when he was elected Pope in 1513, at the age of 37, he was the last person in history to achieve the pontificate without ever having been a priest. He did eventually become a priest about a week after he was elected a Pope, but uh, that was just a formality. At the commencement of his holy rule, the new Pope Leo X is said to have declared, Since God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it. Now, fortunately, Leo X's idea of enjoying the papacy was unlike that of Alexander VII, who hosted papal orgies, or Julius II, who cast himself in the light of a conquering Roman emperor. Instead, most accounts agree that Leo X was a pretty moral and decent fellow, a lover of books and music and the arts, and exceedingly generous with providing charity. Now, he wasn't perfect. He, he spent and borrowed money pretty freely. He saw nothing wrong with the practice of granting indulgences for those who wished to give money to the church, and he ignored Martin Luther's criticisms of the practice of granting indulgences, and he, you know, also ignored 94 other criticisms Martin Luther had as well. So, given Pope Leo's disposition, we can assume that the new pope would gladly have kept Michelangelo at work in Rome. But Pope Leo had no plans to see Michelangelo spending his time working for a previous pope, and so it was to Florence that Michelangelo was sent, to work not for the glory of the Church of Rome, but for the glory of the Medici family. After all, that was the whole point of Lorenzo the Magnificent's aspirations for his son Giovanni. The papacy would serve the Medici family, not the other way around. 
Pope the X's plans for Michelangelo in Florence centered around the traditional family church of the Medici family, the Basilica of San Lorenzo. There had been a series of churches dedicated to San Lorenzo on this spot in Florence since 393 A.D., and at one time San Lorenzo served as the cathedral in Florence, centuries before the building of the Duomo. In the early 15th century, the Medici family, growing in power and wealth, commissioned the rebuilding of this church and hired Filippo Brunelleschi to design it. It's a milestone in the history of Renaissance architecture, and it is the final resting place for most of the Medici family since the 14th century, as well as containing the graves of several faithful servants to the family, such as Donatello. But what the church lacked was a facade. The front wall of Brunelleschi's church had been left unfinished, just a mass of rough masonry without its decorative cladding of marble typical of churches of the time. Now, at first, the commission for the building of the facade went to Giuliano da Sangallo, the older friend of Michelangelo, fellow Florentine, and experienced architect. But Sangallo died in 1516, opening the commission up to a new architect. Now, it seems as though the commission then went to Michelangelo and to an architect with which he had to work in partnership, but it should be remembered that, at this point, Michelangelo had very little architectural experience. But, apparently, the architectural plans from Michelangelo's partner, Baccio D'Agnolo, did not impress Michelangelo, and so Michelangelo took it upon himself to design the facade himself. A wooden model for the façade, made by Michelangelo, still exists in the Casa Buonarroti Museum here in Florence. And so, in early 1517, a solo contract was drawn up for Michelangelo's first architectural commission. Now, just as Michelangelo had recently done for the tomb of Pope Julius II, the first thing Michelangelo did, connected with this façade commission, was to go to the mountains and quarries of Carrara, to search out the marble needed for the façade of San Lorenzo. But this trip to Carrara to find marble, Michelangelo knew, was to be very different than when he went to select blocks for the tomb of Pope Julius. The requirements for the façade of San Lorenzo were orders of magnitude more demanding and complex. First off, Michelangelo's design for the façade called for it to be completed entirely in white marble. Now, that might not seem like too much of a big deal. After all, Florence could already boast of several churches covered in marble. True, none of them were purely composed of white marble from Carrara, but from various colors sort of mixed together to form patterns and designs, incorporating green marble from Prado and red marble from Siena. Now, Siena and Prado are much closer to Florence than Carrara is, and so the stone, if it's all coming from Carrara, is going to be a much more expensive uh, proposition than if it was going to be made up of uh, various different colors from different places. And also, the facade for an entire church would require much more marble than the mausoleum planned for the Pope Julius, hundreds of tons, in fact. But the issue wasn't just how much white marble was needed. Michelangelo's design also called for at least eight monumental scale figures, which would require monumentally large blocks of pure white marble. Now, you see, the façade itself would be easy to quarry because you could do it in smaller pieces. But Michelangelo needed eight large monumental blocks for his figures. But even further than that, there were to be twelve long columns to be made from single blocks, and each column was to be twenty-two feet long. Nothing had been quarried on this scale, and in such an amount, since antiquity. And, of course, that was the point of doing it in this way. Michelangelo designed a façade that could challenge and perhaps best the Romans, a façade in Florence which would be compared to the Pantheon in Rome. Michelangelo himself declared that this façade would be, quote, the mirror of architecture and sculpture of all Italy. Now, once Michelangelo had successfully wrangled the commission from his architectural partner, his plans for the façade grew more and more ambitious and expensive. His personal involvement in the project also grew, Initially, the sculptures for the façade were to be carved by other sculptors, but Michelangelo grabbed up those jobs as well, to the disappointment of some of his Florentine sculptor friends. And Michelangelo didn't just stop with making the statues. The marble itself must be personally selected by him for pure whiteness. The quarrying of the marble would be led by Michelangelo, and even some of the large equipment for quarrying the marble columns would be designed by Michelangelo 
right down to the pulleys. For three years, Michelangelo went back and forth from Florence to Carrara and Pietrasanta dozens of times, managing work crews in both locations simultaneously, communicating with his papal patron in Rome, and expanding the scope of the project until the price tag for the facade grew lavish, even for a pope. By 1519, Michelangelo's workshop in Florence had received hundreds of tons of marble, and work finally might begin on the facade. However, seemingly without warning to Michelangelo, Pope Leo X took Michelangelo off the project, and the commission ground to a permanent halt. Not one of those stones was ever placed on the facade of San Lorenzo, and in fact, the facade today is exactly as it was in Michelangelo's time, completely bereft of ornamentation and cladding. Michelangelo had spent three years of his life designing, preparing for, and really fantasizing about a facade that would never be. How in the world could this happen? What was Pope Leo X thinking? It turns out he was thinking of mortality and specifically the mortality of his family. You see, Pope Leo X was originally Giovanni de' Medici, the son of Lorenzo the Magnificent, and one of three brothers. His brother Piero died in 1503, and his other brother, Giuliano, the Duke of Namur, died in 1516, right around the time of the commissioning of the facade. So the Pope, Giovanni de' Medici, was the only surviving male of his generation, and his being Pope didn't exactly increase his own chances of continuing the family name. Each of his two brothers had had a son, but when in 1519 Piero's son, Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, died, Pope Leo's branch of the Medici family was in real danger of dying out. The only other male heir descending from Cosmo de' Medici was Ippolito, the eight-year-old son of the dead Giuliano, and who knows what fate had in store for him. To be clear, there were other lines of the Medici family, including cousins, descending from before Cosmo the Elder's time, but the legacy of the direct descendants of Cosmo the Elder and Lorenzo the Magnificent seemed to be coming to a close. Now, Pope Leo X, accordingly, decided that focus should switch from the facade to the honoring of his descendants and relatives, in the form of a new funerary chapel in the Church of San Lorenzo. Michelangelo was given the commission of both the architecture and the decoration of the chapel, and the massive amounts of freshly quarried marble for the facade could be put to immediate use. Pope Leo's father, Lorenzo the Magnificent, had already been buried in the sacristy of San Lorenzo, along with his brother Giuliano. Now, a sacristy is sort of like a church's backstage area, where the priests get ready for the mass and where all the items necessary for the various religious rites are kept. So Michelangelo was to design his chapel as sort of a mirror image, architecturally, to the sacristy, on the other side of the church uh, from the main altar. Uh, so it was sort of a, a new sacristy, and nowadays we do call the original sacristy the old sacristy, and Michelangelo's chapel is commonly called the new sacristy. The original plans for the new sacristy was that the bodies of Lorenzo and Giuliano would be transferred there to be housed in new tombs, and the recently deceased Duke of Urbino and the Duke of Nemours would be buried also in this chapel. So that's kind of where it gets sort of confusing. You see, there's, there's two brothers, Lorenzo and Giuliano, to be buried in the chapel, but there's also Lorenzo's son, whose name is Giuliano, and Lorenzo's grandson, whose name is Lorenzo. So four people buried in the new sacristy, two named Lorenzo and two named Giuliano. Nowadays, people keep them sort of clear in their minds by calling the elder pair of brothers the Magnifici, you know, the Magnificent guys, right? Lorenzo the Magnificent and his brother, who I guess by default is also Magnificent. Uh, and the younger Dukes of Nemours and Urbino are called i Capitani, uh, and that's referring to their military status as captains of the church who worked under the command of their uncle the Pope. But that's getting ahead of ourselves a bit. How did Michelangelo feel about dropping the facade to work on the new sacristy? Well, he was mad as hell. He had fully intended his facade to be the greatest thing he had ever done. It probably took Michelangelo a little time to switch gears to the smaller, less public, and less glorious task at hand, but it seems he did jump into the project with both feet, as the building was well underway after less than two years, just in time for the next calamity to impede Michelangelo's progress. 
which was the death of Pope Leo X in 1521, two years after the new sacristy had begun. So, just as with the tomb commission that Michelangelo had received from Pope Leo's predecessor, the death of the Pope meant new delays and the signing of new contracts. The new Pope, after Leo X, the pious reformer Adrian VI, was no patron of the arts, nor was he a friend of the Medici. The papacy of Adrian VI is probably the point that Michelangelo turned back to carving the figures for the tomb of Pope Julius, who was not a Medici. And those figures would include his unfinished captives, as well as his genius of victory. But as luck would have it, the papacy of Adrian VI lasted less than two years before he died, and most fortunately for Michelangelo, he was replaced by Giulio de' Medici, who became Clement VII, the second Medici Pope, who, like the first Medici Pope, knew Michelangelo since boyhood, and assured Michelangelo that there would be no further delays or complications with the commission. And then, like the last popes, who promised Michelangelo that there would be no further delays, Pope Clement shouldered Michelangelo with yet another commission. There's a small monastery connected to the Church of San Lorenzo, and Clement VII commissioned a library to be built there, mainly to house the fabulous collection of manuscripts and texts of Lorenzo the Magnificent. The room which comprises the Laurentian Library, as it's called, was, in fact, planned down to the last detail by Michelangelo, from the interior decorations to the staircase leading into the room, right down to the arrangement and design of the desks. However, by the time the basic structure of the walls were complete, Michelangelo had left Florence permanently, and so the Laurentian Library is a collaboration of sorts between Michelangelo and the several sculptors who came after him, sculptors who, by the way, practically worshipped Michelangelo and did not wish to impose their ideas on top of his, but who still had to interpret the master's intentions from sketches as well as written and verbal instructions. So the Laurentian Library can be considered as one of the earliest examples of Mannerist architecture. Pope Clement VII had yet other ideas that he wanted Michelangelo to turn his attention towards, but Michelangelo, who had a strong personal relationship with Clement VII and could speak very freely to him, dissuaded the Pope from further distracting him from the work already in hand. Clement VII agreed to this, and he put his money where his mouth was. Time and again in correspondence, the Pope tells Michelangelo to design the new sacristy in any way he wishes, and that money was no object and he meant it. The years of 1423 to 1427 were some of the most productive in Michelangelo's life and stand in stark contrast to the seemingly unending string of setbacks and delays he had experienced in his career since completing the David 20 years earlier. And just what was Michelangelo doing with the new sacristy, with his unlimited budget and free reign? We will hear all about it when the sculptor's funeral continues. <laughs> All right, it's time to give a shout to one of the sponsors of the podcast. That's right, friends, Blick Art Supplies, the largest and oldest provider of art supplies in the United States who ship their quality wares around the world. Their superior customer service, extensive selection, and competitive prices make them the choice for professional and amateur artists, art educators, architects, designers, students, and hobbyists. Virtually anyone requiring quality art materials for work or pleasure. And seriously, there isn't another art supplier on the web with as many supplies and materials specifically for sculptors than Blick. It's really huge. Over 70,000 products for artists of all types. You can get everything you need from dozens of different clays and plasters to fine Italian marble carving tools, clay modeling tools, specialty casting mediums, waxes, body casting supplies, turntables, armatures, books on sculpture. Basically, if you need it for sculpture, they have it. And shipping is free in the U.S. on most items if your order is for more than $100. But Blick is not merely a place to buy stuff. They have product information specialists trained to hunt down answers to your tough questions regarding materials, techniques, and safety. Hundreds of how-to videos are also available on DickBlick.com or on their YouTube channel, including video lesson plans for teachers and product demonstrations. So, that's Blake Art Supplies, but let me tell you how the sculptor's funeral fits in here. You see, by buying your art supplies from Blick, 
you can contribute directly to the support of the Sculptor's Funeral Podcast. All you need to do is this. Go to the podcast website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and click on any of the banner links that you'll see there for Blick. That link will take you right to the Blick website where you can buy what you need. It's that simple. Just remember that you need to click through a link at thesculptorsfuneral.com first so that Blick knows I sent you. Because then what happens is Blick will give the Sculptor's Funeral a small percentage of your total bill. It's like you sort of get a discount and then you donate that discount in support of the show. You are paying what you would pay normally, but by using the link on thesculptorsfuneral.com, a little something trickles down to the podcast. So the next time you stock up on armature wire or mold rubber, modeling tools, and plastilina, do it in a way that supports the only podcast out there devoted to the global community of figurative sculptors. Go to thesculptorsfuneral.com and click on Blick. And support the show. And thank you. And so, finally, it's time to actually describe what Michelangelo had intended for the burial chapel in San Lorenzo, known as the New Sacristy. Now, as always, you can go to the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and click on the image gallery link for that episode, which is episode number 51. And you can check out for yourself a few images of the new sacristy, the Laurentian Library, and the Church of San Lorenzo. I've already mentioned that the room was intended to mirror the old sacristy, built as part of the design by Brunelleschi a century before. But this seems to be the only constraint placed upon Michelangelo. And in typical fashion, Michelangelo set out to create a fantastical, unified statement of humanist thinking within these four walls. The first plan was to create a central four-sided tomb for the four Medici to be buried there, a design that at once recalls his design for the mausoleum of Pope Julius II. And just as with the Julius tomb, the idea for a central tomb for the new sacristy was soon scrapped and replaced by designs for wall tombs. So on these four interior walls of the new sacristy, we find three wall tombs. I Magnifici, that is, Lorenzo the Magnificent and his brother Giuliano, share a single wall tomb, while on the wall opposite that we find the chapel altar. The two remaining walls contain the tombs of the two Capitani, or the Dukes of Urbino and Nemur. Now, I think most of my listeners are a little familiar with those wall tombs, decorated with the famous unfinished allegories of dawn, dusk, day, and night with the effigies of Lorenzo and Giuliano seated above them. One of the more common mistakes people make about these two wall tombs is in thinking that the effigies represent the Magnifici and not the Capitani. In fact, it is the much less well-known and much less remembered Dukes of Nemur and Urbino which have the famous effigy statues and allegories of the times of day attached to them. Lorenzo the Magnificent and his brother share a tomb that was barely started before Michelangelo left for Rome in 1534. So, yeah, that's a bit of a spoiler. Michelangelo is eventually forced to abandon the commission of the new sacristy before it's done, like most other commissions in his uh, middle years. However, unlike the ill-fated tomb of Pope Julius II, the new sacristy, unfinished as it is, is no disappointment. Personally, I find it to be the most convincing example of Michelangelo's supremacy among artists and his true genius. And if you have listened to my other podcast on Michelangelo, you know I am a bit of a Michelangelo skeptic. I don't, I don't buy into the hype about him as much as some others do. But when I walk into the new sacristy, which I do several times a year, every time I feel a bit disconcerted, a bit overwhelmed. The new sacristy is not a big room, maybe 30 feet by 30 feet. And so these statues, these strange and beautiful contortions of humanity, loom large in that small, confined space. And in that space there are no less than seven figures carved by the hand of Michelangelo looking down at you in this small room. More Michelangelo statues in one place than anywhere else on earth, a significant portion of his life's work, displayed in a room whose architecture he also designed. That room is the only place I feel a bit starstruck by Michelangelo, and it happens every time I go. So first, let's examine the, uh, the double tomb of the Magnifici, the one you hardly ever see in the books, as opposed to the Capitani tombs. So the double sarcophagus for the uh, Magnifici is simply just a marble box 
on top of which sit three marble statues. The tomb itself was never started. Only the three figures which were to go onto the tomb are original here. The central marble figure is known as the Medici Madonna, a statue of the Virgin who nurses the Christ child, which for some reason isn't as well known or uh, appreciated as the other statuary in the room. On each side of the Medici Madonna are patron saints of the Medici family, Saints Cosmas and Damien, each designed by Michelangelo but carved by other hands. The Medici Madonna, as well as every other statue in the room, was carved by Michelangelo. Now the two tombs of the Capitani we can discuss as a pair, as stylistically they're twins. Each begins at a floor level with a small box-like base, upon which rests a sarcophagus on legs. The tops of the sarcophagi are about head height, and it's on the top of the sarcophagi we find the signature works of the new sacristy. Two allegorical figures recline on each side of the tombs, one on each side for a total of four. On Giuliano's tomb, we find the allegories of day and night, and on Lorenzo's tomb are dusk and dawn. Then, above the level of the allegories, we find the seated effigies of the Duke of Urbino and the Duke of Nemours. Giuliano de' Medici, the Duke of Nemours, is holding a baton, symbol of his military rank, and he sits alert and looking to the right towards the statue of the Madonna. Lorenzo, the Duke of Urbino, sits with his chin in his hand, looking pensively to his left, and so also at the statue of the Madonna. Traditionally, many observers have contrasted the general attitudes of these two statues, imagining them as examples of the two modes of Christian life, the active life and the contemplative life. Michelangelo did indeed explore this very theme, eventually, in the figures of Rachel and Leah for the tomb of Pope Julius in the following decade, and it may well be that this idea had its first formulation with the Capitani statues. Now, I've been referring to these two statues as effigies rather than portrait statues, because they are decidedly and intentionally not portraits. In fact, Michelangelo never sculpted a portrait in his life, at least none that survive. There's an anecdote recorded that someone questioned Michelangelo about the generalized heads of the Capitani, and Michelangelo is said to have responded that his intention was to portray their inner greatness, not their outer forms. And in a thousand years, no one would know or care what they actually looked like. I think that's a great little anecdote, one that goes a long way to explain some of the oddities of Michelangelo's work. Michelangelo was going for inner greatness, not external realism, in many of his works. I mean, we could, we could actually say the same thing about Michelangelo generally, that his, his greatness as an artist has little to do with technical virtuosity or conventional beauty, and more about the inner power his works convey. I mean, when we talk about how great Michelangelo was as a sculptor, what exactly are we referring to? Speaking merely about his technical ability, he was really no better than anyone else at the time, and not as good a marble carver as others, frankly. He seemed to have little interest in verisimilitude or intricate detail. I mean, nothing in Michelangelo's work is technically difficult to carve. And on top of that, his proportion is often downright bizarre. And it's not just the big head and hands on the David, but the blocky torso and withered limbs in works like The Genius of Victory or some of his later pietas. In fact, we might all have considered Michelangelo quite a mediocre sculptor were it not for his supreme gifts of composition, design, and expression. One of the most confounding feats of his genius is the ability to express such raw power and such lofty intellect simultaneously, and free from all the distractions of technical virtuosity. The simplicity of his carving is actually part of the power. Let's take a look at the allegories of the times of day in this context. They're strange, contorted, disproportionate, and they appear to be sliding off the tombs they're perched on. At the same time, they are mysterious and powerful, and create an appropriately somber mood for this funeral chapel. The two female figures, Night and Dawn, are finished to a high degree of polish, while the male allegories of Day and Dusk are not finished, the figure of Day especially being very rough indeed. But it doesn't matter that Day barely has a face or that the figure of night 
seems to have the body of a man with fake breasts stuck onto a well-developed male chest. It doesn't matter that none of these bodies are completely natural, or that the poses we find them in are even possible. To dwell on all this is to miss the point of Michelangelo, and is to misunderstand Michelangelo's genius. One final note about the figure of Knight, which is the one that you know people talk about the most, the one that looks like a man wearing fake breasts. Uh, many of us know the story of someone asking Michelangelo, you know, who did you use for the model of Knight? And Michelangelo responding by pointing to one of his decidedly male workmen. Now, whether that story is itself true, what certainly is true is that Michelangelo, like many of his contemporaries, drew his female figures from male models. But where a lot of people go wrong is in the assumptions based on this practice of Michelangelo's. Some attribute his use of male models for female forms to his sexuality, or even to misogyny. Others go farther and say that Michelangelo didn't know what a nude woman looked like, and thus couldn't actually draw or sculpt women. Now, of course, these are all very silly ideas. I mean, are we really to suppose that Michelangelo just couldn't get a female to pose if he really needed it? Or that his immense powers of observation and drawing are just limited to guys? I mean, it also ignores all the drawings that we actually have from him of women. Just look at the figures of the Sistine Chapel, for instance. Plenty of feminine forms there. Maybe not fitting into our contemporary notions of how feminine form should appear, but certainly fitting into Michelangelo's. Strong, muscular, and yes, manly. As historian William Wallace points out, masculinity in women was a laudable ideal in the Renaissance. And to attribute masculine qualities to a woman was considered a compliment. The writer Piero Aretino, as well as others, specifically praised this statue of Knight as being very beautiful and one of the most perfect statues in Florence. No contemporaries of Michelangelo had any problems with the way she was sculpted, and the questions that we raise today about the statue have as much to do with our own biases as they do with Michelangelo's. Again, Michelangelo was concerned with what the statue represented intellectually, not with making a statue look pretty or alluring. I mentioned that Michelangelo left the new sacristy unfinished. We don't know exactly what else was intended for the new sacristy, and the placement of the tombs happened after Michelangelo's departure and was largely an educated guess of his intentions. But we do know some things. Uh, for instance, uh, there were four more statues that were meant to be placed under each of the allegories of the times of day. The composition as it is now would make a lot more sense with these reclining figures added in, and would probably eliminate the impression that we get of the allegories sliding off of their perches. The four missing figures were to be river gods. River gods are, in fact, a type of sculptural composition as much as they are a subject. River gods, or other allegories of bodies of water, have traditionally been represented as reclining figures, usually with one bent knee. This goes back to at least ancient Rome and probably Greece. And while Michelangelo never carved these river gods in marble, he did begin at least one full-size model in clay. And miraculously, that clay model still survives. Apparently, it was preserved for several years in the hopes that Michelangelo would return from Rome to finish the new sacristy, and it's been preserved carefully ever since. This modeled torso is made up of wood and twine and tallow and wax and clay, and it can be seen at the Casa Buonarroti, the Michelangelo Museum right here in Florence, which also houses several of his smaller wax and clay models for various other works. If we can imagine the river gods in place, under the allegories of time, we can begin to piece together a larger meaning for the wall tombs generally. Michelangelo seems to have intended a three-level tomb, similar to the three-storied design he had made for the tomb of Pope Julius, and each level representing a different level of reality. The lowest level, that of the river gods, represents nature, the four rivers of the world, or perhaps, as one historian proposes, the base materials of flesh. Higher up, we encounter the sarcophagus as well as the contorted figures of time, and their combination of mortal remains with the allegories of time create a clear statement that our time on earth has limits. 
Then, above that, the idealized, eternalized figures of the dukes, revealing their soul's inner truth, outside of the reach of the ravages of time or nature. Now looking even higher than that, at the wall of the sacristy itself, above each of the wall tombs, we find in the architecture a large empty space in the form of lunettes, where Michelangelo had planned to paint frescoes. A drawing survived which scholars think might have been done in preparation for a scene of the resurrection for a lunette in the new sacristy, and we might imagine similar biblical scenes to go into the other lunettes. But just imagine if the new sacristy had been completed in the way Michelangelo intended. A chapel entirely by his hand, architecture, sculpture, and painting. A total work of art. As it turns out, Italy would have to wait until the coming of Bernini, until such an encompassing unification of the arts at the hand of a single genius could come to pass. So, finally, why did Michelangelo halt work on the new sacristy and move to Rome, never to return to Florence? Once again, powers beyond the control of even Michelangelo decided his fate for him. In 1527, after several relatively uninterrupted years of work on the new sacristy, a cataclysmic disaster befell Clement VII in Rome. The succession of popes who treated the papal throne as though it were the throne of a secular ruler finally caught up with them. As any prince or emperor who fights wars with others over territory and wealth knows, sometimes you lose. And Rome, under the military and political control of the pope, was no exception. In 1527, the Holy Roman Emperor's army entered Rome and sacked it, the first sacking of Rome in a thousand years. It was a brutal military occupation, during which time Pope Clement found himself first a prisoner in his own castle, and then an exile, fleeing to Orieto. The undoing of the pope had a direct repercussion on the city of Florence, who had long lived under Medici rule, and not always happily. Now that the Medici Pope had been ousted, anti-Medician forces in Florence rose and expelled the remainder of the Medici family. Needless to say, all Medici projects were halted, including the new sacristy. But that was far from the end of Medici rule. Eventually, two years later, Pope Clement signed a treaty of peace with the Holy Roman Emperor, and the treaty put the city of Florence back under Medici control. But the newly liberated Florence would have none of it, the majority of Florence wanted to retain its republican independence and were willing to fight for it. Michelangelo, himself a deeply loyal Florentine who cherished his city's liberty, joined the rebellion, placing himself at odds with his childhood friend and biggest patron, the Pope. As an architect, Michelangelo was called upon by the city of Florence to oversee its fortifications and battlements. He inspected the town walls and suggested improvements and took other measures to ensure the safety of the city including, and this is my favorite thing in the world, Michelangelo, he hung mattresses from the windows of the bell tower of the Church of San Miniato. Uh, San Miniato has a strategic location up on a hill south of Florence. And the idea was that the mattresses would protect the bell tower from being toppled by cannon fire. Like the cannonballs are just going <laughs> to bounce off the mattresses. I, I don't know if the tower was ever shot at, but the tower is still standing, so maybe it worked. But Florence was up against impossible odds, with both the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope as its enemies. Trade became a disaster, and famine and plague soon spread throughout Florence, killing Michelangelo's brother in 1528. As the military forces approached the city, many Florentines fled, and this number included Michelangelo, who fled to Venice with a few friends. Now, the idea was then to continue north to France, where he had a standing invitation from the King of France to come and work for his court, an offer which was sounding pretty good right about that time, because despite Michelangelo's service to the city with regards to its fortifications, because he fled Florence, he was suspected by many to be secretly allied with his old family friends and benefactors, the Medici, and he was denounced as a rebel. To Michelangelo's credit, Instead of continuing on to France, he came back to Florence to defend himself against the charge of betrayal to his city. Also, if he didn't come back, he was in danger of losing all his possessions, and by this time Michelangelo was a rich man, whether he dressed like it or not. Anyway, 
Long story short, Michelangelo assisted Florence in its struggle for as long as Florence could hold out. But in 1530, the siege ended with Florence's surrender. Pope Clement forgave Michelangelo for taking Florence's side, and Michelangelo got back to work on the new sacristy in 1531, after a hiatus of nearly four years. But things were never the same for Michelangelo in Florence. Along with losing his brother to plague, his father died in 1531, and Michelangelo felt the loss deeply. In addition, the Medici family were now back in secular power in Florence, backed by the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, and the newly appointed Duke of Florence, Alessandro de' Medici, was a despotic ruler who hated and distrusted Michelangelo. And throughout Florence, during this grim period, sporadic reprisals against Republican sympathizers like Michelangelo had occurred, and Michelangelo was justified in fearing for his own life. Only his contract with Pope Clement for the new sacristy kept him in Florence. And when Pope Clement died in 1534, the 59-year-old Michelangelo immediately left Florence for Rome, never to return, leaving in his wake a mountain of uncarved blocks and half-finished statues. Well, I want to thank you all for listening. And don't forget, you can check out uh, the image galleries and additional content at thesculptorsfuneral.com or the Sculptor's Funeral YouTube channel or on our Facebook group page as well. And while you're on the Facebook group page, you can join in the conversation. You can ask a question, leave a comment about the podcast or about sculpture in general. You can post current events and much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast at Stitcher Mobile or on iTunes. Or subscribe from any service from which you get your podcasts and receive the podcast automatically downloaded on your PC, tablet, or mobile device each and every week. And if you want to help the podcast reach other people just like you, leave a review of the podcast or give the podcast a rating on iTunes or wherever you subscribe. And don't forget, at thesculptorsfuneral.com, you can click on the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies, and clicking on the link and buying from Blick helps to support the podcast. And for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.